here's the situation. You need to sneak past a guard, so you bop him on the head and put him in another room where he can't stop your adventure. But right before you leave him there, he pops up and he asks Scroggly, is this how concussions work? Find out in another episode of my hit series, that's not how that works at all, where I use silly movie tropes to learn things about the real world. There are several problems with the classic movie trope of making someone go safely nighty-night to get them out of the way. First, you probably won't knock them out. Most movies have a 100% out cold rate, but in real life, you're way more likely to just make them angrier. Problem number two, any loss of consciousness can have long-term problems. Your brain is floating inside a disgusting head liquid like a pickle in a jar, and if you shake the jar, the pickle bounces into both sides, and that is very bad for the brain pickle. Memory problems, mood swings, confusion, depression, basically every character in action movie has the symptoms of CTE. Mr. Bond has CTE. Mr. Fu Panda. Mr. Hour 2. The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles are gonna have some very very difficult times when they become the midlife mutant ninja turtles. Leo is depressed all the time, Donatello can't remember his work password, Mikey's anger problems have only gotten worse, and Raphael is another one of the turtles. And definitely don't ask me what happened to Splinter. But the biggest problem as a movie trope is that people who get knocked out usually wake up within a few seconds to a few minutes. If you get knocked out long enough to be put in a car, brought to another location, tied to a chair, and then you wake up and go, I'm not telling you anything, that is very bad. When you come to after being knocked out that long, you don't just wake up and say, where am I? There is puking, there is shaking, there is a loss of muscle control. I cannot stress this enough, you do not want to shake the brain pickle. So if you watch a movie where somebody gets knocked out on the first try, stays knocked out and wakes up without any consequences, then that's not how that works at all. Our hero is in a fierce battle, but then, oh no, he's been hit. Fortunately, we look down and find out it was just his shoulder, a totally fine and okay place to get shot, right? Right? Find out another episode of my hit series, that's not how that works at all. This is a segment where I use lazy movie tropes to learn something about the real world, and I've always wondered if those throwaway wounds are as minor as they seem in action movies, and the answer is no. Here are some of the things in your shoulder that seem important. There's a big artery there called the subclavian artery that feeds the whole arm, and if you pop that, it could get very bleedy. There's a big bundle of nerves that controls your arm, that seems useful, and then there's a super complicated joint that would be tough to put back together if you exploded it. What all of this means is you'll probably survive, but your arm might not. And that's just the stuff that you could hit directly. If any of that fragments or bumps into other stuff, it could get much more dangerous. Your heart's right here. That's not very far from the big pumper. And that's all assuming you could help stat. If you don't get to a level one trauma center in a couple hours, the risks go way up. This is true of all the other no big deal wounds too, like getting shot in the leg, bones, arteries, nerves, risk of infection, probably need surgery right away, might lose the limb. The point is your whole meat bag is full of good stuff. Don't puncture the meat bag. If you're a writer and you absolutely must have a non-lethal wound, as far as I can tell, the best place would be the butt cheek. It is funny, it has got a lot of muscle and fat to protect the good stuff, and most importantly, your big dumper is far away from your big pumper. You know the thing in movies where the villain wants to get some information from James Bond, and so he gives him truth serum, and then James is incapable of holding back? Is that a real thing? Find out on another episode of my hit series, that's not how that works at all. It would be morally weird, but undeniably useful, if there was a serum that would make somebody incapable of telling a lie. If you could just use medication to automatically turn somebody into George Washington or Jim Carrey or Sir Mix-a-Lot. But there just isn't. Which is not to say people haven't tried to invent honesty juice. The closest we've ever gotten was sodium pentothal, which makes you sleepy. It's just like waking up from wisdom tooth surgery where you might get a little chatty. But what it makes you honest about is small stuff, not big stuff. It makes you say, I've always thought it would be amazing to be a horse. And in addition to not making people more honest, it does make them much more suggestible, which means you get way more false confessions than real ones. People will take credit for anything when they're being tortured. They'll be like, I was on the grassy knoll. I'm D.B. Cooper. I'm the guy who suggested to my friend that he take his mistress to the Coldplay concert. But wait, you might say, we do have a truth serum. It's called getting wasted. Well, no. It'll cause people to tell you how they really feel about their boss or reveal the actual reason why your cousin isn't invited over anymore, but what it won't do is make you tell the truth. Drinking can actually make some people lie more. The theory is that lying is bad, but if you lose your inhibitions, you'll lose that part of your brain that's like, hey, don't lie. So if James Bond gets truth serum, then he doesn't talk about how he actually doesn't like M or why his cousin doesn't come to Thanksgiving or just how wonderful it would be to run at full speed, the wind whipping your shiny mane, then that's not how it works at all. In movies, there's one surefire way to catch a liar. Hook him up to the old polygraph. But can these squiggly needles really tell fact from fiction? Find out on another episode of my hit series, That's Not How That Works At All, where I use tired movie tropes to learn about the real world. The concept of a polygraph is simple. Instead of dating other graphs one-on-one, -on -one, it dates many graphs at the same time. But the way this promiscuous machine actually works in practice is that you hook a bunch of sensors up to a person that measure breathing, sweating, heart rate, and blood pressure. And then you compare the results when you ask a person simple questions like, did you have cereal for breakfast? 
with more complicated ones like, have you done any murders? And if the sweat needle gets all wobbly when you ask them about murdering, then they're probably lying. Solving crimes is so easy. These graph swingers have been around for over 100 years, and there's only one small problem with it. It's completely made up junk science that doesn't work at all. But aside from that, they're fine. The main problems are, number one, all of these physical markers can be indications of anxiety, but as every millennial knows, having anxiety does not mean you're lying. It's called answering the phone, and I don't want to do it. Number two, if a cop asks you about breakfast and then asks you about murder, of course you're going to react differently when they're trying to pin crimes on you. And number three, guilty people are good at countermeasures, innocent people are not. You would get the same quality results if you asked people questions while doing that foldy paper thing, and then you were like, it looks like you have 15 kids, drive a Lexus, and do a lot of stabbing. But the scary thing isn't that they use it in movies, it's that real law enforcement people use it all the time. So if a cop in a movie uses one, that's plausible. But if they find the correct suspect using it, then that's not how it works at all. If a car crashes in a movie, what happens? It blows up every time, right? But I live in the world and I've seen a lot of cars and they don't seem to be built out of bombs. So that got me wondering, is that how it works? Find out in another episode of my hit series, that's not how that works at all. Presumably, the splody part is the gas. That's why we put gas in cars, is because we use it to make a lot of little tiny explosions that run the car. So if a tiny bit makes a tiny boom, does a big bit of gas make a big boom? Almost never. For gas to explode, it needs to be mixed with a very precise amount of air and then exposed to a spark, which can happen in rare instances with cars, but that's the same odds as if you had flour, eggs, and milk in the back of your car, and you got in a crash, and they formed pancake batter. Liquid gas is flammable but not explosive, so if there's already a fire in the car, it will burn, but it won't go kablooey, which is why when they're making car explosions in movies, they frequently take a jug of gasoline and put it on top of an actual explosive. What about electric cars? They don't run on tiny explosions, they run on batteries, but as anyone who has ever owned a Samsung phone or an Apple laptop knows, sometimes those can explode. But that's also extremely rare, which is why we're willing to put our phones in our pockets and our laptops on our laps. And the same thing is true of electric cars. If you are on or near an electric car, the battery is pretty close to your junk, and we just wouldn't do that if they exploded all the time. So why do cars in movies blow up at the slightest provocation? Because fireballs look cool as hell. And honestly, in movies like Fast and Furious, the fiery car part is the least unbelievable part of it. They also fight submarines and flex so hard that their cast explodes off their arms and have lots of close friends as adults. And that's not how that works at all.